what motivated you to compile all of the memoirs that that you have in when we when we came home it's a book that i really appreciate because it has a lot of different views um, from people who served in the vietnam conflict in very different capacities what what motivated you to do that and then also to put put out a second edition so to keep at it well you know when i came back from the service uh and was discharged i went to uh school right away i, I went to devry uh, where I got my associate degree. And uh, on Fridays, I was living at home. And on Friday, after work and school, my dad and I would have depth charges, you know, which is kind of a short beer. We'd drop a shot of bourbon in there and uh, drink it. And we'd tell each other stories and talk. Yeah. He would love to talk about his experiences coming back from World War II. Mm. And, uh, you know, he came back from the Pacific in November of 45. And as he told these stories, he would get this far off look in his eyes and he was back there. Uh, we never talked about my coming home experiences. And it just, we just, the typical of Vietnam, you just didn't talk about it very much. Yeah. So after he passed, I started thinking about uh, his stories and, and what he said. And, uh, and I thought, you know, it would be interesting to write a book uh, comparing the coming home stories of World War II Korea and Vietnam veterans. So I figured, well, I better start interviewing World War II veterans because we're losing them rapidly. So I interviewed a couple and it just didn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, they could, you know, they could give you dates and places and things like this, but they couldn't, they couldn't get back in the moment. You know, it was just too far, too far past. And so I said, no, this isn't working. It's not what I, you know, what I'm looking for. Yeah. So I decided, and I hadn't, to be honest with you, I hadn't even talked to a Korean war vet. Right. And, uh, you know, they're kind of in the shadows and, yeah. and they're getting older and we're losing them. Yeah. So I decided that uh, what I wanted to do was just talk to Vietnam veterans of all branches and um, all, you know, of men and women. I even found some Australians. Yes. Yeah, um, you know, some Red Cross donut dollars. And I want to right. compile these stories. So you've got a, a wide range of uh, types of service across the military branches in the book. Um, some see combat roles, some uh, not. Donut Dolly's obviously not combatants. Um, is there anything though that you would say, here's a, here's a thread that runs through, if not all, a majority of the of the things people say as they reflect back on, on Vietnam, of course, there's gonna be a lot of difference, but are there some general, general, general um, observations that folks who reflect back on the war seem to come to in one way or another? You know, um, it's interesting. I mean, there's, uh, I, I think a common thread is anger. There's a lot of anger amongst the, the veterans. Um, and you know, it, it's an interesting thing that um, I came in contact with some people I knew before I, I was in the service. And one of them uh, asked me for a copy of the book and I sent it to him. And um, his brother asked him, so what, you know, were there any surprises in the book? And he said, yeah, it surprised me how, anger, how angry everyone was. And I think that anger is a common thread of Vietnam veterans. Um, and that's also part of a PTSD thing on many cases. In many cases, it's just anger. Sure. Uh, the other thing is that uh, the wall in DC is our savior. I mean, that's uh, a sacred place to Vietnam veterans. And that's uh, some veterans still cannot bear to go there, uh, but most go there and it's, it's a very emotional time for them. The first time after that, it just gets, more meaningful. And I, and I think that the wall is important to, uh, to people who were not in the service, but who were alive, especially at that time. Uh, it brings back um, the turmoil and, and the times that we had. And that was, that's a very common thread. Um, yeah. Of course, physical problems right now because of Agent Orange and whatnot are another one. Sure. Even if I remember right, uh, a couple of the Donut Dollies 
think that they may have some physical problems related to Agent Orange. Um, but, no the, but my understanding is the VA doesn't doesn't recognize that though, since they were not formally military. Right, and you know that they to me the Donut Dollies are the most tragic people of the Vietnam War, because first of all they were all volunteers. They all had to have a college degree. Uh, they came over there and did a year tour. They went out to fire support bases. Um, one of them was wounded. Um, and they came back with varying issues. They were subject to mortar attacks and rocket attacks, just like we were. Um, and then they were in areas that were highly concentrated of, of Agent Orange. So they came back with PTSD issues, with Agent Orange illnesses. They get no help from the VA and they get no help from the Red Cross. So they're on their own. And a friend of mine even started a movement uh, and, and was petitioning Congress to allow them to be buried in a national cemetery. And Congress wouldn't do it, which is too bad because they're just as big of veterans as the rest of us are. Wow. You, you said that a common thread is anger. Um, what is the what would you say is the main source of that or the main sources of of the anger that that vets feel I, I, that's a real complicated uh yeah. issue on on why so many of us are angry um and in in a personal case sometimes i i, I know sometimes i don't um but i think that there's anger at uh, the at the way the war was run there's anger at uh, the way we were treated when we came home. And uh, some were treated real poorly, but I think for the most part, people were apathetic to the people who came home. Um, I think more people were subjected to that than, you know, than uh, protesters throwing garbage at the bus. Um, but you know, it, it's hard to say. When, when I left Vietnam the second time, I was extremely angry. And I don't know why at that point. I, I was just knew I was angry and I was mad at everything. And, and it took a long time for me to get over that. And I still have issues of it. And um, it's a common, it's a common thread. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a theme that comes up. Uh, some veterans do face, um, you know, the protesters screaming at them, throwing things at them. Others say they didn't experience that at all. But um, I don't recall a single of the folks who give their memories in your book saying that they were met by great interest in what they had done, great interest in what they had experienced. It seems uh, the far more common experience was just, as you said, apathy, a, 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 just a lack of interest and not talking about it, not well, asking that's about true. it, not showing interest in it. And, um, and you know, I've heard stories of, uh, you know, of guys who came back and run into somebody from high school who says, oh, where you been? I haven't seen you in a while. I've been in yeah. Vietnam for a year, plus, you know, other time in the service. And uh, I think that too, you know, one of the things that bothered me is I came home and, uh, you know, people are out partying, they're going out drinking, they're doing this. And, and it's like, it, it never happened. And there were still people dying over there. Yeah. And it's like, uh, you know, no one seemed to care. No one, nobody just seemed to care, except those who were there. And, uh, and, and the few who, you know, were actually actively protesting. One of the real surprises to me is that a number of um, vets in your book mentioned experiences they had when they went to the VFW. And maybe this is something I had heard before but it hadn't stuck, and uh, but it really stood out to me. I don't know how many, five, six, seven, eight, maybe more veterans who recount their memories in your book said that they went to the VFW, they're asked the veterans of, the veterans of foreign wars, you know, sort of meeting place, the post. Uh, they were asked by the guys there, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm a veteran of a, the war in Vietnam. And the response was, you know, that's not a real war. Uh, you know, you're not a real war veteran. And they basically, they were told to leave. Um, that was, I mean, really surprising. Um, 
I guess I'd just inter be interested in hearing your reflections on that. And also, as I think about that, you know, of course, we have in our mind the idea of the greatest generation. Um, and I'm, I'm having a hard time piecing those, these two things together, the idea of the greatest generation, which I, you know, I've adopted that view myself of this really impressive generation that grew up in the depression and won the second world war. But, you know, that image I have is really challenged by what these Vietnam vets describe when they go to the VFW bases and uh, VFW po uh, posts and are basically told that, that they're not welcome. Um, what, what comes to your mind when you reflect on that? I have uh, talked to um, not a ton of veterans, but a number of veterans who had that same reception from them yeah. and told to leave. And uh, there again, there was a lot of anger at that. They told us wasn't a real war and you're losers and all the rest of this stuff. Wow. And um, I didn't experience that because I didn't try to join the VFW. I didn't try to join the American League. I just stayed away from it. But, you know, there's an organization called the Vietnam Veterans of America, and they were formed because of this. And their slogan is, never again shall one generation of veterans abandon another. And that is their slogan, and that's why they were formed. And unfortunately, they're dissolving in 2028 because there's nobody coming up behind us. I mean, this is it. You know, when we're all dead, we're gone. Um, but that's, you know, that's an organization I do belong in. And, um, it, you know, my father never felt that way. He was a World War II vet. Of course, his two sons were, were in Vietnam. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, it's, a, it's a terrible thing that, that even they felt this way. So, you know, there, you, you know, you go back to the anger thing. So here you have uh, Vietnam veterans coming home it met with uh, a very mixed bag in the country, a very uh, you know diverse reception, none of which is real positive. And then you go to the VFW where you feel you should be among brothers, and you're turned away from them too. So you know you had a lot of veterans that uh, now uh, put it away, put it put it in the past, and didn't talk about it. You had people working next to each other that were veterans that never knew it. Right. Uh, because they just didn't talk about it. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, that, you know, that became an issue too. It's a little different now, you know, because now we wear our Vietnam hats and, and this right. kind of thing, but we don't wear our Vietnam fat hats for people to say, thank you for your service. We wear them to recognize each other. Mm. And whenever we see another Vietnam veteran, we always say, welcome home. That's our greeting. Yeah. And, uh, and we shake hands and just say, welcome home. And that's good enough. Um, I wanna ask you about your own response to thank you for your service. I think um, what I saw in your book is the same thing I've heard from vets and that is varied responses. Some, some veterans are appreciative of that. Other veterans feel almost repulsed by it. Um, I'm a peacetime Navy vet. Um, and I wore my, you know, the hat from my ship once, actually here in Alaska, I wore it once. And um, at a little stand at a festival, you know, a woman looked at my hat and said, thank you for your service. And I've never worn that hat since because what immediately went through my mind is that's the exact same sentence that a combat veteran from Vietnam is gonna hear. And, you know, okay, I served in the military, but, peacetime Navy aboard an aircraft carrier is a far different situation during the Reagan presidency is a far different situation from serving in Vietnam. And I don't want the same thing said to me that's going to be said to, to Vietnam vets, to Korean War vets at that time, even the World War II vets. Um, what is your own response to that? I, if you wear your hat in public, so I imagine you, you hear yeah. it a good bit. What is your own? I, I wear my hat. And, yeah. you know, I'll tell you a story. It was interesting when I started this project back in 2017, I think it was. Yeah. And um, I was at a golf outing in Myrtle Beach. And uh, I was sitting at dinner with a table with nine other guys, one of which had served in the National Guard, the others had served, but they're all my peers. And we were sitting there talking, I was telling him about this book I was writing. And I said, you know, I said, now I said, I 
wear my cap and, and people say, thank you for your service. I said, but you know what? No one from my generation has ever thanked me for my service. Mm. And they were surprised. And of course, then they all said, thank you for your service, which was kind of like, oh, come on, you know, yeah. but uh, no one had. Mm. And I still think hardly anyone ever does. You know, now I hear young people for the most part, younger people than me in a different generation say, thank you for your service. And I, and I always say, thank you. I appreciate it, I guess, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean much to me right now. Uh, it, it's just something that, you know, some time ago it would have been a lot. Just the other day uh, at a cafe, um, I saw a veteran with a hat on. Uh, he had been in Vietnam actually uh, from 59, uh, very, very, very early with the Navy. He was there 5960, according to his story. Um, and what I always ask when I go up to a Vietnam vet with a hat on is the thing I always say is, what year were you in Vietnam? You know, just trying to get a, a little information. I guess it's the interviewer. Um, what, what, what would you recommend to folks? Because thank you for your service, I think can become a, somewhat of a glib cliche. Um, mm -hmm. You never know the motivations of the person saying it. And I guess there's, you know, express some gratitude for just making the effort to say it rather than just being silent and apathetic as you know, you guys experienced when you came home before. What, what would you recommend folks do though, if thank you for your service has become a bit of a, a cliche at this point. I think the best thing you can say to a Vietnam veteran is welcome home. I've heard that before. And, and that's good enough. You don't have to go any further. Just say, welcome home. Mm. That means more to us than anything else. Yeah. You mentioned um, in one of the things you wrote about your own experience, I think you say, you know, I wonder what's become of those war protesters and, and you paint, you know, briefly paint a picture of yourself talking with them. Um, you know, it's interesting. I've been interviewing vets for gosh, 20 years or so. Um, but I can't recall ever anyone ever saying, well, I was on the other side. Do you, do you want to talk to me? Um, I think there's important information in that, that you, you don't, whereas the Vietnam vets are wearing their hats, a lot of them, uh, you don't see the protesters um, wearing their hats. Um, so I, I, I don't know how to finish that sentence, but that's just an observation I make. But I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. But um, if, you, if you did happen to over here on a plane, you know, guys sharing memories of when they were protesters at Berkeley or something like that. And then you found yourself in a, in a position where you could talk to them. What, what sort of things do you think you might say um, to them? Well, I think that I would ask them, first of all, why they took out their anger at the government on us. Mm -hmm. You know, nowadays there's the, you know, there's the phrase that you can hate the war, but love the warrior. Mm. Uh, and I would really want to know why they did that. And if they felt proud of that. Mm. And, you know, there again, there's an old saying that people were for, will forget what you say, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And those type of things that uh, they said to us, or, you know, the junk they threw at the bus when we were going from um, to Oakland from McCord Air Force Base. Uh, they'll never forget those. And generally, you know, that might have been a very small minority. We don't know, but that was the reception. And so that is, you know, to us, the perception of the way we were treated. Um, as far as the the protesters go, you know, in the Ken Burns series, in the last chapter, there was a woman, and I forget her name, but she was yeah, interviewed. I, rem I remember that. And she yeah. apologized for the things she said to Vietnam veteran. Yeah. And I reached out to her after I saw that. Oh, you did? Wow. Yeah, I did. And I, I found her on social media, and I sent her a message. And I said that, you know, I saw this, 
and I'm a Vietnam veteran. And I really appreciate the apology that you made. And she messaged me back and said that once again, she was very sorry and felt real bad about that. And I, you know what, I'll tell you when, when that happened, I, I felt, I felt pretty good. And, uh, you know, I understand why people protest the war. That's the, that's what democracy is all about. You can protest all you want. That to me, that's fine. Yeah. But don't drag me into it and and say that somehow I'm responsible and call me you know all kinds of derogatory names because I just did my duty. I just did what I was supposed to do, and uh, you know, lumping everybody into this. You know, you had so many people that were drafted. Mm. And uh, we were probably would have been out there protesting, but they were treated the same way. And they were probably mentally on the side of the protesting. But now all of a sudden they're caught in the middle. So a lot of them changed their opinion to being angry at the way they were treated too. As you were speaking, I don't know that I've ever really um, focused on this before, but you know, a lot of that protesting was done in the name of, you know, an abstract love, you know, mm -hmm. um, but it was so much of it was so hateful and so lacking in empathy um, for the, the people that you describe. I mean, there are some people who, you know, I've talked to vets who felt very motivated by President Kennedy's inaugural address. You know, there are mm -hmm. some in your book who mentioned that specifically. Mm -hmm. um, and so they answered that ideal. And as a matter of fact, communism was and is a horrible and destructive thing. Uh, there are others, as you say a lot, who are just drafted and whose mm -hmm. hearts may have been in one place, but they're, you know, not wanting to go to jail, was, you know, right. kept them kept them on that track or, or perhaps a sense of duty. And, and uh, as we see these images um, of the protesters and read in your book about things that were said to the vets, such an incredible lack of empathy, but it, the irony stands out that somehow all of this was done in the name of some abstract concept of love or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Love in the abstract, but not love in the particular for the 19 right. year old who's right, who's right in front of you. Well, that's it. And you know, so many people came home, um, coming home from a war zone and leaving a war zone, no matter what job you did, I mean, it didn't matter. There, first of all, there was no place safe in Vietnam. No place. You know, there were people of every job who were killed in Vietnam. People in the band, people, cooks, people, not just the infantrymen out there or helicopter crews uh, or artillery guys. I mean, there were people killed all over the place. So people are leaving a war zone where you have a certain mindset, which you have to have in a war zone, no matter what you do. And they're coming home and all of a sudden, 24 hours later, they're in San Francisco or Seattle. And, and you have people, you know, they're, they're, they're just trying to, you know, get through it. And here there's people treating them bad. You know, when my dad came back from World War II, first of all, he went over with the guys he served with. He served through the war with the guys he served. He came home with these guys. And they were on a ship that took almost two weeks to cross the Pacific Ocean. Well, they had a lot of time to sit there and talk amongst themselves about common experiences, things they went through. They were able to work things out to a certain point. They were able to come to an understanding, to be able to talk about the things they did, the things they saw. And then all of a sudden they're home to a great reception. Well, we left Vietnam. And we're, you know, we're in the United States 24 hours later. Yeah. And, you know, the second time I came home, um, the night before I left, I was out on the bunker line in a foxhole with my rifle. You mentioned that. Yeah, you're right about that. It really is that this is really one of the truly unbelievable things about the Vietnam War. It, it, some of the vets in your book say this. I've heard vets say it. I mean, even to the extreme of I was in a firefight and three days later I was on a farm in Montana. Yeah. You know, that that kind of thing. It's just you look back on that and it just seems so crazy. Yeah. That that things could have been um that way. 
You just mentioned your, you know, um, you, when you came home for the second time. So of course you spent time in Vietnam. You actually extended and, and spent more time in Vietnam than, than most, most veterans. So if we could just talk a little bit about your own service. First, when, when did you go into the army and why? I joined the army in 1969. Uh, I graduated from high school. I was 17 years old in 1969. Mm -hmm. And in my family, college was never an option. So you either went to work in a factory, I lived in Chicago, uh, or you went into the service. Well, I was 17. My brother was in the Marines at that time. Yeah. And my dad wouldn't sign for me to go in the service after high school. Yeah. So I went to work in a factory and I did that for about a month and that was not for me. So I quit my job, uh, bought a plane ticket, went out to California where I had a friend of mine living with his family, bought a motorcycle, had a great time in California in 1969. And, um, and then I came home just before Thanksgiving, spent Thanksgiving with the family, and in December, two days after I turned 18, I joined the Army. Wow. And, and then in, in January, I was on my way to basic training. Now, so going into the Army, this was purely a what do I do with my life now sort of thing. There wasn't any sense of, you know, just speaking honestly, it sounds like you're not, you're not suggesting there was any sense of, you know, personal mission that I, I want to go to Vietnam or something like that. I mean, no. was it in your mind that if you, you know, if I go into the army now, there's a really good chance I'm going to go to Vietnam. I mean, things are really hot in 69. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, there again, I didn't join to go to Vietnam. I joined the army. I had no sense of direction. Mm. Um, I didn't want to just hang out like a lot of my friends were doing. Uh, and as a matter of fact, my brother went to Vietnam in 1969. So when I joined the Army, he was there. And uh, while I was in AIT in Fort Gordon, uh, I was called into the commanding officer's office. And uh, he looked at me and he said, do you have a brother in Vietnam? Now, I don't know how they knew that, but they did. And I said, yes, yeah. sir, he's in the Marines. And he pushed a piece of paper across to me and he said, sign this and you don't have to go. Wow. And I said, well, sir, I'll take my chances. He said, no problem, pull the paper back. And then a couple of months later, I got my orders to go to Vietnam. Wow. What, what did Vietnam mean to you at that time? Was it just something that a 19 year old kid without a lot of opportunities, that's just what you're gonna do? Or you know, was it the fight against communism? What, what did Vietnam mean to you at that time? A lot of things going on about Vietnam and fighting communism and stopping communism and and uh, and all the rest of that. And uh, you know, I, I I bought into that. I figured that was you know what we should be doing. And uh, you know, so I you know I believe that 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 was the thing to do. That I you know was I gung ho to go there? No, but I figured if they sent me, they'll send me. You know, personally, I was hoping they'd send me to Germany, but mm -hmm. yeah, that didn't work out. So, uh, you know, so when the time came and I received my orders, I was accepting and, and went over there and, and did it. But, you know, after I got to Vietnam, you know, I was 18 when I went to when I went to Vietnam. Wow. And after I'd been there a while, I volunteered to fly as a door gunner with uh, the 128th assault helicopter company. And here I was a 19 year old kid doing this. And it didn't take long for me to look at this. And I sat back and I came to my personal thought realization that seemed like to me, the only reason we were there was to kill more of them than they killed of us. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really see any big inroads being made against communism. And, you know, I mean, it was just, we were going to the same place, they, you know, time after time. And it, it just like, it, there was no end to this. There was no end to this. Yeah. And by the time I left, I, I remember saying to myself, they won't last two years after we leave. They meaning the Arvin, the meaning the South, South Vietnam. And it, and it was just a little over two years. And that right. was it. Did you have much personal interaction with Arvin forces at all? Did you serve with Arvin forces at all? Yeah, we, we flew with the Arvins a lot. Uh, and, and they varied greatly in, in uh, how they were. When we flew with the Arvin Rangers uh, on the Cambodian border, they were very good. 
and uh, they would, uh, you know, you'd fly in and they were ready to get out of that helicopter right away. And, and they were very good and rarely had to be pulled out. Some of the Arvins, and I forget which division it was, it was either the 5th or the 25th division, but on a couple occasions, and, then, and I don't want to blanket this saying all the Arvins were like this, but on a couple occasions, we flew in combat assault and uh, set the ship down and they wouldn't get out of the helicopter. Wow. Yeah. And uh, finally, the pilot called in the intercom and said, throw them out. Wow. So we started throwing them out and then the rest of them got out and, and we, we took off. So it was and there again, it just led me to the realization of what are we doing here? You know, what, what's the point? That's got to be surreal. I mean, as an 18, 18 year old, um, you're thousands of miles from home fighting for their country, for the independence of South Vietnam. As you say, some of the Arvin forces are are good, um, but you know, a good number are not. And you're experiencing this. I mean, that must have been almost surreal. You just said it. Like, what the heck are we doing here if these folks don't seem to be committed to fighting for their own country? Yeah, it was it was a kind of a come to Jesus moment, you know, wow. where it's like I I just don't get this. You know, people were getting killed, people are getting maimed. And uh, you know, changed forever. And and how is this going to end? How you know they were in the withdraw? They were withdrawing American troops at this point, right? And yeah. and you know when 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 your tour was over, there we're talking. You know, I talked before about my dad and his guy. You know, you just got called in the orderly room, and they said, "Here's your orders. You can go home now." Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah. I'm glad I was here. Did I do any good? Did I did I contribute anything to the, yeah. the peaceful transition here? No, not really. It's just the way it was. Wow. So then it's, you know, so hearing you say that, it's, um, you know, surprising then to hear that you extended to, you know, to actually spend more time in in Vietnam. What was the reason for, for that? Why did you decide to extend? Well, I knew I wasn't going to make a career out of the army. Mm. And, uh, you know, in actuality, when I went in the army, I wanted to like the army. And when I was over there, it was pretty messed up. I mean, it was towards the end of the war, it was pretty messed up. I went over there in 1970. Yeah. And uh, I figured, well, if I extended for six months, turned out to be seven, uh, I'd be able to get an early out when I got home because I'd only have seven months left to go. So I'd get an early discharge and I'd be out and I could go to school. So I had, you know, progressed to the point where I wanted to go to school. I wanted to get on with my life and go to school and make something. And uh, so I extended and uh, I was due to come home on May 22nd, the final time of 1972. Well, on May 1st, 1972, they ended the early out program. So I didn't get my I didn't get my early out. So I came home. They sent me to Fort Huachuca, Arizona, where we were warehoused because we had all these guys coming back from Vietnam. They had they didn't know what to do with us. So we'd have a morning formation at 9 a.m., which is unheard of in the army. And at 930, we were finished for the day. And that was it. But they wouldn't let us go home. So we just yeah. kind of sat around and, you know did nothing and we're in the middle of the desert you know so it's oh god and then they asked me if i wanted to realist i said no i don't think yeah, so yeah you know there's there's so many paradoxes um that come up um in discussions with vietnam vets and and listening to you here's here's another one that you're talking about this you know, this unreal situation where you're a teenager thousands of miles from home fighting for the independence of a country, many of whose own soldiers don't seem to be interested in fighting for it. And that's, that's, there's something bizarre about that. You've mentioned the anger that Vietnam vets feel because of that whole situation. Um, but then there's a, there's a striking sentence that you write in, uh, in, in, you know, the, the essays that you've written that sort of comprise your memoir. And that is, you say that after 
coming home. You come home for a while. And then I think you're supposed to be back in Vietnam just before Christmas. And you say, I'm, I've already missed a Christmas. So I'm going to basically go AWOL, you know, absent mm -hmm. without leave. And I'm going to have Christmas at home. And, you know, and then you describe dealing with the captain and, and all of that. You get back to Vietnam. And the sentence you have is um, that you were glad to be back um, in South Vietnam. Um, so you come home from time in Vietnam, Christmas time at home, uh, and then you go back and you say you were glad to be back. So, so this is a paradox, right? Because this is a, a terrible experience. This doesn't make sense. Why am I here? Um, the people at home don't care. Uh, but yet I'm, for some reason, glad to be back. How does, how does that make sense? You know, there, there again, that's a little, little hard. When I came home, uh, I was, you know, one of those people who uh, got on the Freedom Bird and, and came home and uh, there were protesters waiting, you know, outside of Oakland when, where we bust in the to process to go home. Yeah. Um, because I was going back to Vietnam, I didn't have to, you know, get a new uniform or any of that stuff. So I was pretty much in and out of there. And, uh, and then I was back home in Chicago in the winter where I froze. Mm -hmm. Um, but I just, I didn't feel comfortable. I didn't, I, I felt out of place. I felt, you know, I mean, the family was real nice to me and, uh, you know, I, I saw my old high school friends, but everything, everything just didn't gel. I just didn't feel right. I, I was uncomfortable. I was tense. I was nervous, uh, anxious. And uh, after Christmas, you know, I was supposed to be back the 22nd. I went uh, back on the 26th. And uh, fortunately, I had a good captain who didn't mark me AWOL. And then I went back home because my flight wasn't going to leave till the 1st. And, uh, but that week I was, I was just real nervous, real jittery, uncomfortable. I just didn't feel comfortable around anybody at that point. Yeah. Um, and then when I got back on that plane, I relaxed. Wow. And, uh, you know, it was, it was interesting because I was with a plane load of mostly new guys. Mm. And here I was with my faded old jungle fatigues and all the rest of that stuff where they were brand new ones. But I, I landed in, in uh, Benoit and I, and I got off that plane. I breathed in that hot, humid air. Yeah. And I just felt comfortable again. I felt home. I was going to go see my, my buddies. These are guys who I went through a lot with. I'm going to go see my buddies. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, that's a, when you're 18 and 19 years old, those are very formative years. Mm. You know, people, you know, people who never experienced that talk about their college years all the time mm. and how much fun they had in college or not fun or, or good experiences. Well, you know, our experiences were very hard, but they're our experiences. They're what we lived with. Sure. And going back uh, in that situation, I just felt more comfortable. I just felt... Uh, you know, it just yeah. felt better to be there than it was to be at home. At home, I was tense and nervous and uncomfortable, and here I wasn't. And it gets to a, another paradox, a, kind of the same theme, but a, a little a little more intense. And it comes up a few times in the memoir. Just look at some passages here. So uh, there's a veteran here, uh, Marvin York. Um, and here's how the, the last... Um, paragraph begins the first sentence of the last paragraph is i hated the war the last sentence of that paragraph begins i loved the experience it was dangerous it was a high i hated the war and yet in some sense i loved it um, then we come to um, this veteran here this is um kurt robinson again right at the end he says the war was useless but I'd do it all over again. I've heard this so many times from Vietnam vets, um, from those who see combat to one extent or another, and mostly, and they say, you know, combat is horrible. It's, you know, it's, it's awful, but there's something about it that you miss. 
there's something about it that's kind of awesome at the same time. Um, you know, what are your own thoughts, uh, your own responses to that? Because again, that's so paradoxical. And but you hear it again and again and again. It was, it was terrible. I wouldn't wish it on anyone else. But I kind of there's parts of it I kind of miss too. Well, one thing I do want to say first of all is that Marvin has since died, unfortunately. Uh, he passed away here last year, I think it was. Um, but would you do it all again? What is it? You know, is it an adrenaline rush? Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I've talked to other Vietnam veterans that uh, were either involved in combat or, or in, under fire, and most everybody was at some point or another, they talk about, uh, you know, the, the guys who flew about the adrenaline rush and flying into a landing zone. Mm. And it is an adrenaline rush. You're on top of things. You're seeing things so clearly that things have a tendency to look like they're moving in slow motion. Mm. And uh, so, you know, is that something you want to do again or want somebody else to do or your kids to do? No, absolutely not. Mm. But there is a, a camaraderie there and you're never closer to people than you are in those situations. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, people can't understand it. It's hard, to, it's really hard to explain. But, you know, when we, when we veterans get together, we're not friends, we're brothers. Mm -hmm. And that's a big difference um, because we are brothers. We've been through things together, but, you know, some people, you know, the adrenaline rush was something that they never were able to capture again. There's a fella in there, you know, Frank Hodd, I think he was, and he gets a motorcycle and he's he trying to recapture that adrenaline rush, right. which could prove deadly to a lot of people if they weren't careful. But they're trying to, you know, re-experience that and you can't. Um, whether I would do it all again, I don't know. I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure. Uh, there are times when I'd say I would do it all again and times to say not a chance in a million would I want to do that again. But, you know, everybody's different. Uh, Robinson, he was a, an infantryman. He was a heavy in the infantry. Yeah. And when he says if he had to do it all again, he'd do it all again. I believe every word he's saying. But, you know, what he went through was, was hell there, too. So um, it's a complicated question. Yeah. Just a, a couple more questions. There are um, themes that come up. Um, I wouldn't say unusual themes, but themes that don't often come up in memoirs. So that leads me to think that, you know, these are particular questions that you asked or to assume that. It seems that one of the questions that comes up a number of times in the comments that the veterans make is how they responded uh, in April 75 when, when Saigon fell. You know, that famous small building, there's that famous photo of people scrambling up the ladder um, to get on that helo in April 75. Um, that building is still there. It's, um, I'll never forget my response when I was at a, there's a little shopping. <laughs> the irony of it um you know a, across the street from that now is like a, a high-end mall right um so anyway there's a plaza in front of the mall and i just turned around and looked up and saw that saw that little building now which is dwarfed by this symbol of capitalism now just right across the street or they don't want to call it capitalism but it's not communism whatever's going on in that mall is not communism it's unbelievable but of course, that you know, you see that building, you're reminded of that photo, you're reminded of April '75 when Saigon falls. What was your own response to the fall? I, I guess if I can just add, you know, if you go to Vietnam in in '64, '65, you know, it's plausible to think this might turn out okay. I mean, South Vietnam might be independent. Um, you're there in '68. Maybe you can keep thinking that. My sense is by the time you're there, 69, 70, 71, 72, early 73, 
I mean, you know that this thing is, is just not going to work. I don't want to put those thoughts in the, into your mind, but that's my sense. The later you're there, the more the, the greater the sense is that, as is often, you know, you hear veterans say, I don't want to be the last one killed before this thing comes unglued. Well, that's, that's exactly it. Uh, yeah. When I came home the second time, I came home on an Air Force C-141. Mm. And, uh, of course, there were no protesters everywhere, anywhere. And... Uh, and there again, the attitude was for those in the military, they didn't want to be the last one to die in Vietnam. And for the civilians, they didn't care anymore. It was pretty much over. They didn't care. Nobody cared. It just didn't matter anymore. And there were still people dying in 1972. There weren't a lot of soldiers there, but they were dying in 72. So when 1975 happened and the fall happened, I guess I should say I wasn't surprised. I was surprised at how quickly it all fell apart. But I was so angry. I was so angry. I remember sitting there watching the TV and cursing. And, and my mother was there. And she was in the kitchen. And I was at my dad's house. And I was just as mad as could be. I mean, I was so mad. I was cursing. And, and I realized, I looked over, I realized she was standing at the kitchen sink crying. And I went, and all of a sudden it occurred to me the way I'm acting. And I went over to her and I put my arm on her shoulder and I said, ask her what's wrong. And she said, I just want to see you happy again, wow. which was a shock to me because I felt I was just being me, but I was a much angrier version of me that I was, that, that I wasn't before I went over there. In 1975, when Saigon fell, uh, veterans, donut dollies, everyone, either met it with real anger or a deep, profound sadness. And uh, I think I went from anger to sad. Uh, and it's hard then for to just put that aside and put it behind you and go on, because it's like, well, you know, what, what was all this for? What, what was all this for? What about the people I know that died there? Mm. How do you justify this now? So it was, it was a very difficult time, I think, for everyone there. You know, I, maybe for the protesters, they were happy. I don't know. They might have been real happy that it was over and we were out of there. I don't, I don't know. Like I say, I've never... I've never had one engage me in conversation on that. When you um, say that your response was anger, you know, there's a lot of stuff to be angry about. Would you say that there's more than more than any one single thing? If I, you know, could sort of consciously direct my anger towards something or someone is there is there one particular thing that stands out? I mean, would it be would it be No Din Diem, who in the early '60s just you know was recalcitrant and who caused so many problems in his own country? Is it LBJ? Is it Nixon? Is it the Congress for not you know stepping in to, to help South Vietnam in '74, early early '75? Um, is there any any? I imagine it would be pretty dispersed the anger. But is there any one particular thing that more than any other single thing you would, if you did consciously direct that anger at it, you know, or, or at this person, is there any one particular thing that stands out? Not one particular thing. I think that uh, the waste, the loss of life uh, angered me more than anything else, that people died to try to prevent this from happening. And then in a heartbeat, it was over. Uh, angry at the government, very angry at the government. You know, we said we'd help these people and we broke our word. You know, people, I think people for the most part before Vietnam trusted the government. I don't think they trust them since. And I think there's good reason for it. But when we let them down, when we told them we were going to help, and then we just said, you know what, now nah, you're on your own. Goodbye. Have a nice day. It was like, what the hell? You know, I mean, I'm getting, I'm getting worked up on this right now. I mean, it, it angers the hell out of me. It just ticks me off. And uh, yeah. 
I, I don't know. You know, that you, it's just like, I just kept thinking about the loss of life on both sides. You know, the, the South Vietnamese, the, the North Vietnamese, for the most part, North Vietnamese soldiers were just like American soldiers. I mean, you know, they Very seem country. to have a reason to want to be there, whereas we, we just were there to kill them. But, um, you know, I think the average peasant soldier was just as, just as like you and me. Yeah. Of course, uh, problems related to Agent Orange, um, you know, come up a lot. Agent Orange is one of those, you know, it's just one of the many sort of tragedies that come come from this war. In, in the immediate term, I imagine it, you know, it must have saved lives as a defoliant. It makes, you know, makes it harder for the VC to get into places. And, you know, there's a reason they used it. And, I, and in the immediate term, I'm imagining that it saved lives, but of course the cost over the decades has just been tremendous. Um, it's, it's the rare Vietnam vet you meet these days who doesn't have any issues related to Agent Orange in, in my experience. How about you? Have, you? have you dealt with anything from Agent Orange? Yeah, I mean, I have uh, heart issues. I have neurological problems um, and, and they're all related to Agent Orange. Um, Agent Orange, you know, they, the, the government will sit there and tell you that ranch hands stopped in 1970, I think it was, where they say they stopped blanket spraying all over the place. But you know, the Agent Orange was all over the place. I mean, part of the problem when I was flying, we'd fly in areas that were defoliated and you couldn't believe it. Everything was dead, everything. Not a single thing alive. It was gray, it was dead. Now, who would think that wouldn't help hurt humans mm. is you've got to be kidding yourself. Right. But you know, on, on a personal level, it, I was at a place called Fuloi and it was heavily sprayed around us. Well, we had a, in our battalion, we had a, a helicopter rigged with a spray equipment. And during the day, this would fly around different areas and spray Agent Orange. Well, in the evening, they would fill this, this drum in there with uh, some type of insect killer to keep the malaria down. And they would fly over the base and spray that. Well, they never cleaned the equipment. I know the guys who worked on it. So you had Agent Orange in there mixed with this stuff and they're flying over spraying us with this every day. And on our particular uh, section, every company had a section of the perimeter that they had to defend. We didn't have the infantry defending our base. So uh, we had a three quarter ton truck with a 55 gallon drum of Agent Orange on it. And these guys would go out and spray in front of our bunker to keep the weeds down so that we'd have a clear field of fire if we needed it. Well, one of those guys died a number of years ago, had cancers all over him. And uh, I kept in touch with him. He was a good friend of mine. And uh, so there was Agent Orange. It was all over the place. And they knew at that time that it was no good for human beings. And I mean, still it's, did it. it's a really good Good point you make. I mean, when you see the effects of Agent Orange, how could you, how could you possibly think this isn't going to have any impact on, on human beings? Mm -hmm. It's kind of un and, unbelievable. And the Vietnamese, you know, the Vietnamese children, there's so many deformed children because of Agent Orange, because they were heavily sprayed. We, we received probably a much diluted factor. But, you know, I've seen reports that say it's going to take seven generations to purge this stuff out of our bodies. And the Australians have the same problem. Sure. I, I did want to, I want to give you a chance to respond, you know, because what I said a minute ago was an assumption. You know, we're using Agent Orange for a reason. And you said, you know, we're using it so that we have a clear field of fire. You know, um, it kills the, it, you know, kills all the, the plants that makes it harder for the VC to hide and things like that. My assumption is, and you know, respond to this if you think I'm right or wrong. My assumption is that in the short term, it served its purpose. Um, the problem, of course, is that the impact, the ongoing impact, as you just indicated, for generations. Um, you know, that's that's of course the the ongoing problem. I mean, do you agree with that? That in the immediate term, Agent Orange served a, a purpose. It's just unfortunately that in the longer run, 
I mean, obviously it's had this horrendous impact. No, I don't think it did. You know, you have a country, it's a, it's a, it doesn't look big on the map, but it's a big country. And you have huge swaths of jungle. Well, you can't spray the whole country. Because first of all, you have people farming and, and, and the rest, you can't spray the whole country. So you pray, spray certain areas. So if you have a, a road leading somewhere, you spray it on both sides to give them a, a broader chance of somebody not ambushing them. But as far as the uh, enemy went, they just go around it. You know, so you have squat, swaths of dead country, but you know, five miles further on, you have dense jungle. Well, they're just gonna go through the jungle. Oh. So how much are you really saving lives here? You know, you're destroying more lives than you're ever saving. And, um, you know. I hear that, right. Because listening to you there, you remember what a, um, I can't think of a better word, what a wily adversary the VC were, right? And whatever challenge they face, they're going to find some way to, to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you. I appreciate you making that point. And given the the horrendous costs in the years after, I don't think anybody would want to try to argue that it was a program that was worth it. Um, uh, it's just, it's just awful. It's just awful. You said at the very beginning that you wanted to interview World War II vets. And one of the things that made it hard is that by the time you got around to talking to them, um, their memories were so far in the past and they themselves had advanced so far in age that it was, you know, it's difficult to have meaningful conversations. Um, we're not there yet with Vietnam vets in terms of age, but, you know, but father time never stops working. And, um, We've talked about many of the problems with Agent Orange and all of the health problems that Vietnam vets are having. You just mentioned a Vietnam vet who just passed away last year. Um, you clearly have an interest in encouraging Vietnam vets to share their stories and, and not just to share the stories, but to get the stories recorded. Um, I, I share that interest I and mean, obviously here we, are, here we are doing it. What word do you have um, to Vietnam vets who are um, reluctant to, to share? Um, what, what word do you have to them um, by way of encouraging them to at least consider sharing? Well, I think that they should share their stories. I think that uh, people need to understand. People need to understand, and not just blood and guts stories, but, uh, you know, how they felt about what they were doing, how they felt about going over there, how they felt after they came home. Uh, I think those are, it's important to know this. It's important to know uh, how they were treated so that doesn't happen again. It's important to know what the government did so the government doesn't do that again. Mm. That's a lofty hope if ever there was one. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's important that they, they tell their stories. Uh, it's just like I tell people, I tell veterans, you know, have you filed for disability? No, I haven't filed for disability. Well, you need to file for disability. No, somebody needs it more than I, or, or this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, somebody once said that uh, uh, veterans are like used cars, you know, like or rental cars. So you go in the service, when you come out, if you have a rental car, you have to return that rental car in the same condition you got it. Well, they need to do the same for the vets. And if there's something wrong with them, they need to let it be known. Uh, to me, the important thing about filing for disability is that that's the only way you're gonna be counted. If you don't need the money, you don't want the money, give it to charity, give it to a veteran-based charity. Uh, but the only way you're going to be counted as having an Agent Orange illness is to file. Otherwise, there's no record. And I think that when they sit there and come up with all these chemicals to use, they need to look back at this and say, holy cow, look at all the veterans that were impacted by this. And um, that, I think, is real important. It's very important that they do that. It's not about the money. It's not about the money. It's about 
being counted. That's to me is the most important thing. I, I hear you. Something else I've noticed. Um, so you're, you know, you're encouraging vets to get into the VA system and then, and also, you know, to, to share their stories. One of the things I've noticed, you know, over the years as I've done these discussions is that, you know, the discussion will be had and, you know, maybe, you know, some folks will take a look at it, but, um, you know, a, a veteran then will pass away and all of a sudden that recorded discussion becomes really important mm -hmm. because this is all we have, you know, mm -hmm. often what I've found. Uh, and that's happened a number of times. So I, you know, I encourage vets to, you know, I understand sitting down with some nosy history teacher or, you know, in your case, I think it'd be a lot easier with a fellow vet and sharing their stories. Um, this can be uncomfortable and time consuming in the moment, but it's so important for history. It's so important for uh, family members down the road. You know, so I, I hope that, that vets who have listened to you, who read, who read the book you put together, who listen to what you've said here, I, I, I really hope that they, that they will feel encouraged. With the Vietnam vets, I am feeling you know, more and more of a sense of urgency um, mm. that um, we want to get these stories, these stories recorded. I received many emails from people, for the most part, saying, you know, I can't believe I've always felt I was, on, I was feeling this alone. You know, dealing with this by myself, I had no idea how many people are feeling the same way. And I received a lot of emails and messages from families mm -hmm. who say, you know, my husband died, but now I understand that he wasn't angry at us. Mm -hmm. He was just angry. And those were the most uh, important messages that I received as feedback from this, is talking about, oh, it gave an understanding to people what, why we are the way we are. And uh, I guess, don't take it personally. You know, we're not angry at you. We're just angry. And we don't realize we're angry. We, we don't have a clue. Mm. This is just everyday life. You know, we sure. came home 50 years ago, and this is the way we've been. You know, and unfortunately, a lot of people go to the VA now and are getting help. And, um, you know, when I went to the VA, this was back in 2013. Uh, we had our reunion. I run the reunions. I've been looking for people and all the rest of this at the wall. And I did real well. You know, it, it was, you know, I was running the reunion. It was good. But I came home. I had two explosive anger outbursts at my wife for something stupid and not physical. I don't get physical, but, I, you know, and I sat down, and I thought about it and I, I went to the VA and I'll never forget it. The psychologist sat down and said, why are you here? And I told him, I said, because I've been pissed off for 50 years and I don't want to go in the ground this way. Mm, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and I think a lot of people, you know, are feeling the same thing. They All of a sudden they're realizing this and they don't like it. They don't like being this way. You know, they, they want to let it go. And you're never going to let go of the of the experiences you went through. But maybe you can help yourself deal with them now. Whereas before, you know, when we came home, the VA didn't even believe in any of this stuff or have right. any programs for this stuff. Right. But now it's a different VA. So right. if you can get in there, get in there. Right. Well, Jack McCabe, I really appreciate the book that you've written. I really appreciate the, the work that you've done, that you're doing. Um, thank you very much for taking this time. I hope other vets um, will hear this. And when I think of veterans, you know, I think you and I, you know, uh, share this. I, I'm interested in hearing from people who participated in, in all aspects of the world of war. Um, and in, in my mind, that includes spouses. I think, you know, and I've heard Vietnam vets say, you know, I have to think of my wife as kind of a Vietnam vet as well. I mean, cause she's, yes. she's lived with the consequences of this war. Um, so I, I hope that, that those who haven't shared their stories or who have, but have something more to share, I hope that, that they, they will do so. So I really appreciate this. Thank you for this time. I really appreciate it.
My pleasure. Thank you very much.